colorectal surgery at St. Charles Hospital um, in Long Island and uh, surgeon and surgical associate of Long Island. Will, thank you for doing this. Um, I know we've been planning on talking about um, colorectal surgery for a few weeks now. Right. And uh, in this epidemic uh, sort of surfaced, which kind of interfered probably with with everybody's uh, practices and with our with our doc talk. Um, but you're sort of more in the thick of it. Um, so before we talk about colorectal surgery, I would uh, I'd like to hear about what's going on with COVID nineteen. Uh, relative to Long Island, uh, and compare that to, let's say, what's going on with your neighbors in um, Manhattan and Brooklyn. Sure, yeah. Um, so New York City's uh, been kind of the epicenter for everything. Um, and out here on Long Island, you know, we're about an hour outside of the city, probably an hour from uh, Queens, which also got hit pretty hard. Um, so it's been slowly kind of trickling out here uh, to us. Uh, but we uh, are definitely um, seeing a huge crunch in terms of uh, our patients in the ICU. Uh, we've opened up uh, additional um, ICU beds at, in other um, units that were formerly, you know, step-down units or uh, floor units. Uh, we converted uh, our PACU into uh, an ICU, um, and uh, we're filling up pretty uh, steadily. Um, there's a lot of uh, extra ventilators and um, PPE that's uh, been secured by uh, the hospital systems in the area. Uh, so it's been kind of, um, you know, we're not quite to the level that New York is, but it seems like we are headed in that direction. So it's ramping up. Yeah, for sure. I think even, correct? even just in the last, you know, 48 hours or so, things that were kind of like, you know, touch and go as whether or not we were going to see as much of uh, the COVID as New York, and I think it's been kind of been played out in the last 48 hours that we are, um, and we're, so we're kind of to the point where it's, uh, you know, all hands on deck, um, next man up kind of uh, situation for the providers. Um, I'm, in fact, going to be helping out in the ICU starting tomorrow um, at a hospital that I don't even work at. I'm getting emergency privileges to uh, go there and help out. So it's kind of, um, you know, <clears throat> every provider in New York State's kind of being called to action uh, to help out. Can you, speak, can you speak more about that, how it has impacted you professionally? So you're volunteering in an ICU, um, I take it because you're used to having very sick patients from a surgical standpoint that you have ICU skills or, and, and then also, so professionally, Professional has it impacted you, and and how about personally? Uh, do you have you been around or been exposed or know people with COVID nineteen, and 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 how is that all going? Um, yeah, so I think every uh, healthcare provider has something to offer in this uh, particular scenario. Um, so <clears throat> even if you don't have any ICU experience, there's still something uh, for people to do. Uh, the hospitals are very strapped. In fact, you know, even last night I was doing a emergent appendectomy in the middle of the night and we didn't have a transporter to physically take the patient from the ER uh, to the OR um, to get their procedure done. So I, as a surgeon, actually physically brought the patient myself to the operating room. Um, so there's, you know, room for um, any provider, um, whether it's nurse or whoever, um, to help out, um, you know, doctors, obviously. Um, and it, your skill level and your training all kind of uh, goes into how much they uh, put on you and ask you to do. Certainly as a surgical resident, we see a lot of ICU care. It's not usually dealing with these medical um, you know, pneumonias and things like that, but we do see a fair amount of it. Um, certainly in terms, in terms of putting in central lines and other um, invasive procedures, we are a good uh, asset in that scenario. Um, so I'm gonna be kind of working along with my uh, anesthesia colleagues uh, who I work with uh, pretty closely in managing uh, the ICU. Um, and, uh, you know, anything that I'm asked to do, I'm, you know, stepping up to the plate to help out as best I can. Um, as far as- What about your, your exposure risk and, and other physicians, you've seen other physicians get exposed and, and how are you managing that? 
Yeah, we've had a number of uh, people in our uh, practice who have tested positive um, and are you know currently out of work. I personally don't know of anyone in dire strength or dire straits, uh, straits uh, um, to speak of professionally, personally. Um, there are um, some close uh, friends whose family members uh, have been affected who are either in the hospital, but thankfully, you know, not in the ICU, but are very symptomatic from it. Um, so it has uh, touched me in, in that way. You know, our practice is very close, you know, a good portion of our providers are anesthesia providers. Uh, so they are pretty highly um, exposed, as you can imagine, in terms of being intubated, it's probably the highest risk uh, when you're doing an intubation of the provider contracting the, the COVID. So they've been uh, hit pretty hard. That's why it's kind of fallen on uh, the surgical side of things to kind of step up a little bit uh, in, in terms of helping out in the ICU where we can. Do you think, um, tell me about social isolation. <laughs> things are related down here in Burma, I think. Um, I think the city has done a good job of locking things down. Um, although I, I think we're still in the ramp up phase here, um, um, and the cases are increasing. But I think things are still man very manageable here. Um, how, how is that going in New York, in Long Island? Well, I think what you're kind of seeing is that in places like New York City, the idea of being socially isolated is probably impossible. And that's likely why they, one of the reasons why they were hit so hard. You know, they're just, people are living on top of each other. Um, and so they really didn't have a real shot to uh, go about social um, distancing. Um, in Long Island, you know, we're suburban, so we probably have a better uh, chance of that. Um, I'm personally from upstate New York. That's where I, I grew up. Um, and they've done a pretty miraculous job of in part because of how rural it is up there um, in ke keeping things kind of under control. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they have more space and you can be uh, afford that opportunity to um, practice social distancing. And so if you have that opportunity, you really have to go, you know, you have to try because otherwise you end up in situations like New York's in right now where, you know, the, things are just going to, are getting, uh, you know, to uh, a threshold that, you know, the governor was saying is, you know, you know, astronomical at this point in time. So, I still think down here we're struggling with testing. Um, how is is testing any different there um, in Long Island? Yeah. So basically, they only really recommend testing if they think it's going to change your management. Uh, in other words, if you're going to uh, potentially treat. Um, the patient, such as, you know, there's been some experimental treatments that they've been doing for uh, certain patients with uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And if you were going to go that route, you would want to make sure you were indeed treating a patient uh, who was COVID positive. Or if you were going to practice isolating the patient in the hospital, you would want to make sure that they were indeed COVID positive. Routinely, we're not, because we don't want to run out of the um, testing supplies, so we're not routinely uh, testing every person that comes in or, and has a complaint. Really, they have to, it has to be a glaring difference in their management style that would make you want to test them. So, so testing is still limited up there too. I feel like mm -hmm. testing is, is, is the big fault in the system um, in that if we could have identified asymptomatic positives or positives and, and isolate them much earlier, um, I think it would have headed off a lot of this that's uh just from what i've gleaned but i don't know how true that is but that's just what i think um uh, it's so, just hard to know who, who initially it would have been hard to know who to test because you know there seems to be like this week-long incubation period and whatnot um it would have been kind of difficult i think for them to really get a right and I guess in a, in a way that's kind of water under the bridge now. Um, talk to us a little bit about colorectal surgery. Um, I'm kind of curious about uh, robotics and, and how that changed surgery for, for, for your area as well as uh, just I, I would think you're dealing a lot with cancer and, and some of these patients really can't wait to be diagnosed and, 
and right. and they're getting put on hold, I would imagine, or maybe not. So how could you comment about about uh, first about diagnosis and and surgical excision and and how COVID has affected that and 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 whatnot. Sure. Yeah. So I do, you know, I'm specially trained in robotic uh, colorectal surgery, also do robotic general surgery, and it makes a huge difference to the patient in terms of uh, length of stay in the hospital, how much pain they're in, how many opiates they uh, require to take post-op, uh, how quickly they return to bowel function, and just overall their outcomes are a lot better. Uh, in this particular case, uh, you know, in this time period where we're kind of limiting any kind of elective surgery, it has definitely put a, a real damper on uh, doing a lot of robotics. Um, there is some concern that, uh, you know, I, I call robotic surgery, laparoscopic surgery on steroids, because it's really like doing minimally invasive surgery, but to a whole new uh, level. Um, and unfortunately, the problem with laparoscopic surgery is that there's some concern that it could help spread the COVID. So they're trying to limit uh, laparoscopic surgery as much as possible in some centers, um, such as like in Seattle, where they've been really hard hit. They're only doing open operations right now. Uh, and New York is probably- Why is that? Can you uh, comment on, on, on yeah. where that might be? Yeah, so the when we do either robotic or laparoscopic surgery, we insufflate the abdomen with air. And the concern is that air that would escape um, when you insufflate it would spread the um, virus uh, into the air and disseminate it uh, throughout the operating room. So because of that, when we do do laparoscopic surgery, we do it with uh, N95 mask on um, to just because you're personally exposed. Um, and it's in order to try to prevent that. But some places that have been really hard hit where they're operating on COVID patients a lot, they have just said no laparoscopic surgery at all. We'll just do open surgery. Uh, we're not really to that point yet, uh, but there are some cases where I would consider that the best option. Would you do a COVID test on somebody who you would want to make sure they're COVID negative before you did laparoscopic surgery? Would that be an yep. indication? I think that's a reasonable thing to consider, um, whether or not you could get it approved by the insurance plan or the health system um, might be an issue, but I think that that would be uh, given that scenario, I think it would be a smart case. Um, for me personally, I'm still doing uh, laparoscopic surgery for cases where I think the open approach would be too morbid uh, for the patient. You know, removing someone's gallbladder laparoscopically versus doing it open is like night and day. Um, laparoscopic surgery for that or robotic surgery for that is uh, so much less invasive to the patient to the point where they go home the next day if you do it laparoscopically or robotically versus if you do it open, it's a week long stay in the hospital. And, you know, then their exposure to COVID over, you know, seven to eight days um, would be much greater. So in cases like that, I would still recommend doing it minimally invasive. But, um, you know, for me in particular, I do a lot of colon cancer work. Um, so right now I would, most of my colon cancers, I'm going to be doing open um, because I think it's, uh, safer for everyone in the operating room. Uh, it's a little bit longer of a case. Um, and, uh, you know, the, although the might, it might result in a slightly longer hospital stay for the patient, uh, it's probably better for everyone overall. There is a comment. I don't know if you can see the comments on your screen, but, and it's really dealing more with COVID and, and, and maybe you have insight into this because you're seeing more patients and you mentioned um, chloroquine and, and azathioprine, uh, but somebody commented, I'm hearing large IV doses of vitamin C, 100,000 IUs is helping patients. Have you heard anything about vitamin C uh, I, IV up there? I haven't personally. Uh, I think vitamin C has been recommended as a cure-all for about a million diseases, and so far it has been disproven at every turn uh, usually the body just, uh, you know, metabolizes it and you, you know, urinate it out. Um, there's no, I mean, it's been recommended in off-label cancer treatments and stuff like that, but we still not, aren't really using it routinely. And, you know, the only thing I can really say definitively is that the data for any treatment for COVID is kind of poor. And the best that we have right now is the hydroxychloroquine with the uh, Um. 
Getting back to colon cancer in screening, I would imagine that 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 um, all endoscopies for screening are on hold right now. Yeah, that's um, correct. Any any thoughts on that as far as you know, potentially missing some cancers that otherwise would need to have been treated sooner? Um, well, so the, the good thing is it takes, you know, about uh, 10 years for a polyp to go from a benign polyp to a cancerous polyp. That's why we say get your colonoscopy every 10 years. Now, some people are a little bit faster than that, and that's why we say every five years for certain high-risk groups or three years for super high-risk groups. Um, but uh, so I don't know if delaying a colonoscopy, you know, three months is going to make a difference. And if we get out to this is um, a scenario where this is uh, something where it's, you know, months and months and months and months, then I would be concerned. But I really don't think, uh, you know, delaying your colonoscopy three months or so is going to make any difference in terms of your risk of a polyp turning into a cancer. So, Will, when we get through all this, I'd love to come back and do another uh, doc talk with you where you could show us images of, of colorectal cancer, of, of, um, of laparoscopic surgery. Um, would that be okay? Either, yeah, either through PowerPoint, or computer models, whatever, even live in surgery. I don't know if you could pull that off, but that would be amazing if somebody yeah, could hold know. your phone. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I could get approval. I could probably... Uh, the Da Vinci, I think, the robot, uh, not with the patient, but when the OR was uh, empty or something like that. Well, yeah, sure. I could definitely do that. And there's definitely uh, like videos that you can take with the Da Vinci robot that we could probably uh, slice up and kind of show and edit out and whatnot that uh, would give you a good idea of what the surgery actually looks like inside. Many people will, will see this on... on uh, on a rebroadcast through Facebook, and, and that's when a lot of questions pop up. So um, hopefully we can get those questions to you if appropriate um, so you can maybe talk to the audience more directly. But I want to thank you again. This Again, this is Will Sellers, Chief of Robotic and Colorectal Surgery at St. Charles Hospital um, in Long Island. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Will. I appreciate it. Take care. You too. Good luck, and, and thank you for all you do. No, thank you. Thank you so much, Will. Um, I'm going to stop.